Thank you, Ben. That was quite an introduction. I'm going to click this share screen button now and see if that works. Okay. Okay, how's that? Uh, it's coming up now. Looks great. Okay, good. Thanks. Good. Well, thank you and welcome all. It's uh, early here in Maui. It's 3 a.m. You know, it's 9 a.m. on the East Coast. I'm going to talk about diabetes today. And uh, on the left, you can see my recent book, Diabetes Breakthrough, The Key to Insulin Resistance. And on the right, you can see a paper that I published late last year, which is how excess dietary saturated fats induce insulin resistance. This is a little known to doctors and to dietitians, and it really needs to be known more because without restricting dietary saturated fats, there's really no way you can reverse diabetes. You can barely control it. Of course, carbohydrates are important too. I do only sell my book on drsteveblake.com because of philosophical issues with Amazon. You did a great job mentioning all of the other books that I've written, and uh, I won't talk about them more here. Thanks, great introduction. There's basically three steps that we need to take in order to reverse diabetes. Restricting sugar and fast absorbing carbohydrates, you know, like junk food shown as this chocolate donut here, they look good, they taste good, but the sugar of course absorbs rapidly into the bloodstream and high blood sugar is the keynote of diabetes. We also need to reduce dietary saturated fats, whether they're from cheese, meat, or coconut oil. Keeping these dietary saturated fats down to about 12 or less grams per day, which is about 6% of calories or less, is very important. And without it, you really cannot reverse this terrible disease. And third, and very important, is we need antioxidants. Antioxidants from whole plant foods are essential for protecting the very parts of our body that diabetes damages, the arteries, the eyes, the brain, and the kidneys. Very, very important that we protect ourselves. So the solutions are eat slow releasing carbohydrates like oatmeal, brown rice, beans, vegetables, nuts and seeds. These are all great sources of slow releasing carbohydrates. And second, stay away from animal fats. Most people get their fats from animals. Uh, these days there are a lot of packaged foods for plant-based people, and you need to watch out, they're not too high in saturated fat, typically from the addition of coconut oil. So the best place to get your fats is whole nuts and seeds. Nut butters are a nice source. Avocados are our favorite source. We live on an avocado plantation here on Maui. And also olives. And I say olives rather than olive oil because the whole olives have more of these protective antioxidant polyphenols that are really important for keeping us all healthy. And that leads to the third solution, which is eat plenty of whole plant foods to get uh, antioxidants and to prevent problems of, which I'll mention what the problems are. They're potentially very dangerous. So in summary, just eat a whole plant diet. How did diabetes come about? How do people get diabetes? The first step, of course, is excess sugars that increase blood sugar. But you know, our bodies are very good at disposing of excess sugar if there's no insulin resistance. So the second part of this road to diabetes is animal fats that increase insulin resistance, saturated fats and animal fats. Third of all, the liver makes glucose. When we're asleep, our liver makes glucose to feed our brain so that brain gets all of its glucose that it needs. But the liver can make excess glucose when we don't need it. And this raises blood sugar. The test for diabetes is usually fasting blood sugar. At this point, most of your dietary blood sugar has already gone away. And you're really measuring to some extent how much the liver is overproducing sugar. So we can also reduce this overproduction of sugar again, with reducing dietary saturated fats. And lastly, the beta cells make insulin in the pancreas. And these beta cells are important. Now they can get killed off by excess dietary saturated fatty acids. 
and they do get killed off. And sometimes there's only half of them left. So let's protect them and not eat excess saturated fats. So how to come back? I think one of the most important steps to come back from diabetes is to reduce the calories that you eat. This is primarily because the liver gets excess fats during diabetes. It can be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or just too much fatty acids in the liver. When we eat less saturated fat, our insulin resistance goes down. And I'll explain that as we go along. Once we can get the liver to not have insulin resistance, it recognizes insulin and stops producing glucose. And that's the way we can get our blood glucose down. And by reducing the calories that we're eating, the pancreas increases the output of insulin. Now you'll see at the bottom of my screens, the reference source that I'm referring to. Uh, this is a study in diabetic medicine from 2013. Excellent study, really, this one, reversing the twin cycles of type two diabetes. And you'll see that all of my information is backed up by good science, peer reviewed studies. And also I only recommend safe solutions, never anything dangerous. A lot of people are saying that diabetes is genetic. And this is true and this is not true. Certain people do have a higher susceptibility to diabetes. American Indians, Hawaiians, the people in the Marshall Islands, all have a higher susceptibility to diabetes than other people. But diabetes was unknown on a whole plant diet that these people ate, sometimes with the addition of fish. But diabetes was just not known. And people with these susceptibilities can also reverse their diabetes using dietary methods when possible. It's not always possible to reverse diabetes completely, but as I'll show you in the studies, diabetes has been backed off to a great extent. The blood sugars go down pretty dramatically, sometimes under the definition of diabetes, sometimes under the definition of prediabetes and into the healthy range. It is easier to reverse diabetes in the first 10 years after diagnosis than it is later because as time goes on and excess dietary saturated fatty acids destroy the beta cells in the pancreas, the ability to make insulin may be reduced. So what really is type two diabetes? How does it work? Well, it's when the sugar gets into our bloodstream and can't get out. That's really the definition. And why can't it get out? Because of insulin resistance. If insulin resistance is low, then the blood sugar is put into the cells, the blood sugar is not too high, and the damage from high blood sugar does not occur. But in diabetes, we have both high blood sugar and high insulin. Now, this high blood sugar in the bloodstream needs to go into our cells to give us energy, brain energy, muscle energy, energy to combat fatigue. But this doesn't happen in diabetes because of insulin resistance. And of course, we can reduce this insulin resistance just by lowering animal fats in the diet, but you need to reduce it very, very much. The thing is, even on a whole plant diet like I eat, when I check my saturated fatty acids, I often get six or eight, sometimes 10 grams a day just eating plants. There's a little bit in any fatty plant food of these saturated fats. So if my goal is under 12 grams per day, you can see there's just no room for any excess saturated fats from animal products or coconut oil. There just isn't room in a diet for that. I talked about the liver and how it makes glucose. The way it works is your body sees your beta cells and your pancreas see that the blood sugar, the glucose is high. When it sees that, it produces more insulin. And insulin is supposed to put the blood sugar back into the cells. Well, the insulin has another feature that it tells the liver, stop making more blood sugar. But if the liver itself is insulin resistant because of these saturated fats, then the liver does not stop making blood sugar. So your blood sugar stays high. In essence, you're making the problem yourself in your liver. 
Now, you may have noticed that doctors and dietitians and nurses and health authorities counsel people to eat more animal foods because it does not contain sugar. Well, it is true that animal foods don't contain sugar. However, it is also true that eating these animal foods, you get more saturated fat, which creates more insulin resistance, which perpetuates the disease of diabetes. So I'm going to present information here and cite references that will help you to decide if you want to try lowering your saturated fatty acids. And you'll see from the studies that it doesn't take very long, typically two weeks, and you see a big change. Diabetes has been going up and up and up. This graph shows that uh, up until at least 2020, the incidence, this is the percent of people with diabetes just keeps going up. 88 million people in America alone have prediabetes and another 34 million have diabetes itself. And type two diabetes makes up 90% of the cases. Type one diabetes is when you're actually not having enough beta cells from birth or early age. So you can't make your own insulin and you become insulin dependent. You need to take it externally. Now this program of reducing insulin resistance that I'm talking about, and I'm gonna give you a 10 step system to do this that has worked in the past at the second half of the slideshow. That can help with type one diabetes somewhat too. It may reduce the amount of insulin needed but typically you cannot reverse type one diabetes unless it's quite mild. Unfortunately, by the time people are diagnosed with diabetes, many people have diabetes and don't know it. Damage to the brain and the arteries, the eyes and the kidneys may already have happened. We can do a lot to avoid these tragedies. Uh, over time, this high blood sugar, it, it glycates protein and damages the arteries uh, with type two diabetes. Uh, this also happens with type one diabetes. Damage to the arteries increases the risk of heart attacks three times. Unfortunately, diabetes can lead to diabetic retinopathy, which can lead to blindness. People know about dialysis sometimes being needed because diabetes can hurt the kidneys. And I study Alzheimer's disease and help with that. And it is much more common with diabetes. Uh, actually, COVID-19 is more common with diabetes too and can be more severe with diabetes. Another good reason to reverse the diabetes. Damaged circulation in extreme cases can lead to amputations. In the Marshall Island study, the most common procedure in the hospital was amputations due to diabetes. Very sad situation, but we can do a lot to stop these problems. And I'm looking forward to telling you just how to do that. I talked a little bit about insulin and I wanna tell you more about what insulin does. As I mentioned, when blood sugar is high, the beta cells in the pancreas produce more insulin. And the insulin is a hormone that goes to your cells. It docks to an insulin receptor and tells the cells, drink in more blood sugar. The cells then pull blood sugar in and they can convert it to the storage form glycogen or they can actually make more fat with it. And of course that's how excess sugar makes you fat. Uh, liver can be stored in the, excuse me, the blood sugar can be stored in the body. Now, there's another thing is when your blood sugar gets too low, then another hormone made in the pancreas, but this time in the alpha cells, produces glucagon. Glucagon does the opposite of insulin. Glucagon tells the liver to make more glucose. It also instructs our cells to make more blood sugar and burn more fat so that we have enough glucose left over for the brain and the brain really needs glucose. You, you know how you feel when you're tired. You don't have enough uh, glucose in the brain. Excuse me while I move something here. Uh, so insulin helps increase glucose burning as well as get it into the cells and stop the production in the liver. 
Unfortunately, insulin resistance increases blood sugar, and that's what we really need to address here. People don't really often die of diabetes. They, people with diabetes typically die from the number one killer in America, which is heart disease. In this very large study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, they looked at 1.4 million patient months of treatment by the drugs for diabetes. And they found that there was limited evidence that any glucose lowering drug prolonged life expectancy, or prevented cardiovascular disease. In other words, these drugs really don't prevent death from diabetes in the, in the large picture. And this is a very large meta-analysis. 1.4 million patient months is huge. So if drugs aren't the way, how do we do it? Okay, here's a pretty picture to relax your eyes and brain. And then we'll go on to talk about saturated fat. Now, I wondered, and you may wonder, well, if people start eating saturated fat, how long does it take to raise blood sugar? Well, in this study, they gave people one fast food breakfast that's high in saturated fats, 20 grams of saturated fats right away. Remember, 12 grams is your daily total. But I have to say that a 20 gram of saturated fat breakfast is not unusual at all. It's really, unfortunately, quite common. One man came into the clinic and we analyzed his diet and he was getting 68 grams per day. So that's more than the 60 he would get if he ate this breakfast three times a day. The saturated fat, just one fast food breakfast, raised fasting glucose 55%. Now, this is amazing because 90 milligrams per deciliter is considered excellent normal blood sugar. But just this one fast food breakfast raised it to 140, which is above 130 is defined as diabetes. This high saturated fat diet, it re reduced insulin sensitivity in two hours. Now, when I say reduced insulin sensitivity, I mean that it increased insulin resistance in only two hours. This is pretty amazing, isn't it? How fast this happens. So you might wanna reduce the saturated fatty acids in your diet by not eating animal fats at all, which would be the best solution and staying away from coconut oil completely. You know, coconut oil really is a misnomer because in lipid terminology, when a, a fat-like substance is solid at room temperature, it's called a fat. So coconut fat would be the proper term for it. Not, Coconut oil sells a lot better than if they call it coconut fat. I think that's, that's why people call it that. Also, coconut fat or oil does not contain any vitamin E. There's only two nuts that don't contain vitamin E, just coconut and macadamia. Vitamin E is a crucial component, and we really shouldn't waste our time with fats that don't contain it, especially if they're damaging us. Now, is it the only study, or are there more? In this study, <clears throat> just one day of eating excess saturated fats, the insulin and blood glucose were raised 17%. Whole body insulin resistance was found in all subjects and it persisted overnight. This is uh, pretty amazing, isn't it? Just in this day, it's 42 grams. Now that's high for a day, but I've seen higher. Not unusual for Americans to eat this amount of saturated fats. This study I found when looking at Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Again, they took 100 students and they gave uh, half of them 30% uh, saturated fat breakfast. Now the other students got the 6% saturated fat breakfast, you know, maybe oatmeal or, or cereal with almond milk, something like that. But the ones that got the 30% saturated fat breakfast, their list memory went down 16%. The hippocampus, one of the memory areas of the brain was damaged by this, this breakfast. How long did it take? Four days, just four days on this high saturated fat breakfast, not the whole day, just breakfast. Sugar intake only went up slightly, just 7%.
but blood glucose went from 77, you would expect in students to have perfect blood glucose and 77 milligrams per deciliter is just perfect. It went up to 118, which is in the pre-diabetic range. So in four days, these students were able to become pre-diabetic just by eating a high saturated fat breakfast. This is from a recent study in the journal PLOS One. Less saturated dietary animal fats cut the risk of diabetes in half in this study. With less saturated fatty acids, the, excuse me, with less saturated fatty acids, the insulin receptors are able to move the glucose transporter to the cell surface, relieving high blood sugar. Instead of causing damage to the arteries, the glucose can then enter the cells and increase energy production. Now, unfortunately, Americans on the average eat three times as much saturated as unsaturated fatty acids. We need to fix that. And that's a big part of why so many Americans have diabetes. This study looked at cheese and butter, followed 7,000 people for over six years. Cheese and butter doubled the risk of diabetes. In other words, those with higher cheese and butter consumption doubled their risk of diabetes. This is to be expected because they're both high in saturated fatty acids. <clears throat> this study I think is interesting because they compared saturated fats with, with sugars to see which created more insulin resistance. And in fact, the saturated fats created more in re insulin resistance than even sugar. Now, ceramides can be made synthesized as a result of too much saturated fatty acids. The way it works is the excess saturated fatty acids are absorbed, enter our bloodstream, and we have receptors typically on immune cells like monocytes. And these receptors are called toll-like receptor four. I abbreviated uh, TLR4 because I didn't have room there. The toll-like receptor four then triggers a cascade of cytokines in the bloodstream, increasing inflammation, arterial inflammation, which makes atherosclerosis worse, increasing the chances of a heart attack or a stroke, increasing inflammation in the brain, neuroinflammation, that can make us more prone to dementia and even Parkinson's disease. Ceramides also are produced and they can induce skeletal muscle insulin resistance. And it's kind of interesting how they do this. They, they inhibit, I abbreviated PI3K, that's phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. So you get saturated fats, they trigger the receptor, ceramides then increase insulin resistance. So this is one of the mechanisms of several that saturated fats increase insulin resistance. I hope you're beginning to see saturated fats as something less than desirable for diabetes. They're actually less than desirable for heart disease or dementia as well. This study shows that the more plants you eat, the less your risk is of diabetes. The vegan diet had the least amount of diabetes and I suspect that those vegans who don't eat coconut oil have an even lower uh, incidence of diabetes, while the non-vegetarian, the normal American diet had the highest incident. The semi-vegetarians had a little bit less. Uh, vegetarians who eat fish, pesco vegetarians had less. And then uh, the regular vegetarians had less and then vegans less again. Another way that animal fats work to in increase insulin resistance and make diabetes happen, <clears throat> or if you wanna reverse that, eating less animal fats reduces the insulin resistance and decreases diabetes. When you eat too many saturated fatty acids, it reduces the number of insulin receptors in the cell membranes by up to half. With fewer of these insulin receptors, it's not possible for the insulin to trigger the glucose to get out of the bloodstream and into the cell. So blood sugar stays high, damaging arteries, eyes, brain, kidneys, and energy is low because the blood sugar doesn't get into the cells. 
the saturated fats make the membranes stiffer, less uh, fluidity as it's called. So there are fewer places for these insulin receptors. When you eat less saturated fat, you get more room for uh, these insulin receptors. And as you stop eating saturated fats, then more insulin receptors can be embedded in your cell membrane so you can relieve diabetes. I'm going to show you a diagram soon that'll help explain this, but the dietary saturated fatty acids, read animal fats, interfere with the signaling between the insulin receptor and the glucose transporter 4. Now, this glucose transporter 4 is like a little bubble called a vesicle that's in your cells. And when it's triggered by insulin, if everything works, then it goes up to the cell membrane and drinks in glucose brings it into the cell where it can be utilized or stored. Unfortunately, the saturated fatty acids interfere with this. Now this diagram shows how it should be happening in our cells. Insulin goes and docks onto the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor here is dark blue and it is a transmembrane receptor. In other words, it, it sticks out above and below the cell membrane, outside the cell and inside the cell. The outside one is called the alpha end and the inside one's the beta end. Why? Because scientists love Greek letters. I don't know why that is. Once the insulin docks onto the insulin receptor, it triggers the insulin receptor substrate to come up and dock onto the bottom of it. When this happens, then this phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase triggers protein kinase B, which triggers the glucose transporter, GLUT4, to go up to the cell membrane and drink in the glucose. This all works fine until we get too many saturated fatty acids. Now, one way, of course, I've mentioned that they block insulin from working is by having half the insulin receptors that we need on our cell membranes. <clears throat> Another way is that they interfere with the insulin receptor substrate, so it cannot dock onto the inside end of the insulin receptor. This is actually uh, caused by, um, well, the saturated fatty acids I mentioned, they trigger toll-like receptor four. That then triggers nuclear factor kappa B, which triggers inflammatory cytokines. You may have heard of the cytokine storm in COVID-19. These inflammatory cytokines include tumor necrosis factor alpha, when the body sees that the too much of this tumor necrosis factor alpha is being made, it produces something called suppressor of cytokine. Suppressor of cytokine does reduce inflammation. A side effect is that it stops this insulin receptor substrate from docking onto the insulin. Now, I know that sounds a little bit technical, but if you want to translate it into plain English, stay away from animal fats and coconut oil. Okay, that's the simple thing. Uh, also, the uh, phosphatidylinositol kinase and the protein kinase B are all blocked by excess saturated fatty acid. So the glucose stays in the bloodstream. The glucose transporter doesn't get to the cell membrane to get it into your cells where it's needed. In this study, reported in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2019, women were given less than half a cup of heavy cream as a source of saturated fatty acid that contains about 25 grams. I, I looked it up to see how much it was. So this is a lot like the students who were given a 20 gram uh, saturated fatty acid breakfast. They were looking at uh, both saturated fats and endotoxin. And I, I wanna explain a little bit about what endotoxin is. It has two names, endotoxin or lipopolysaccharides. They're two names for the same thing. When you, uh, milk a cow, the milk comes out, but when it sits around, bacteria grow in the milk. And the milk is typically boiled, cooked, so that it no longer has bacteria in it, so you don't get sick from the milk. When the bacteria are killed, the membranes of the bacteria, the gram-negative bacteria have membranes, are still intact. And this is in the heavy whipping cream that the women were eating. It's in uh, most all dairy products, uh, perhaps not in raw milk, but that has its own dangers. It's also, of course, found in meat, chicken, fish, 
poultry, pork, uh, all these animal products have these endotoxins or lipopolysaccharides. Uh, so the, in the women who ate this, this whipping cream, the saturated fat goes down into your stomach to the beginning of the intestine and it is absorbed along with the endotoxin. These two are packaged into transporters called chylomicrons, and those are put into the bloodstream. As soon as they hit the bloodstream, the toll-like receptor four spots that there's an infection. There's not really an infection. These, these uh, saturated fatty acids and the endotoxin are not infectious, but they're from bacteria, so they look infectious. So there's a cascade of inflammatory cytokines. And this increases, as I mentioned, the suppressor of cytokine signaling three, which then stops the insulin receptor substrate one from bonding. Now, I, I hope that you're enjoying all of this good science and mechanisms of how this happens. But again, it's really very simple. All you have to do is stay away from heavy whipping cream. You know, you can actually get a uh, hazelnut dairy cream, non-dairy creamer that is thoroughly delicious, excellent, and doesn't have endotoxins or excess saturated fat. Uh, it's, it's made from plants, beans in this case. Now I mentioned that when you eat too much saturated fat as, a, a, as in a diet where you include animal fats, that you have fewer insulin receptors. Well, I wondered why is this? What, what happens? The saturated fatty acids actually can die off from these free fatty acids in animal fats. So you can get a 30 to 60% decrease in the beta cells that make insulin. Then you have fewer beta cells to make insulin. And this is why it's easier to reverse diabetes soon after diagnosis rather than 30 years later. However, a lot of times a low fat, low calorie diet can really help with uh, reactivating some of these uh, beta cells so they can make insulin again. Unfortunately, by the time diabetes is diagnosed, uh, half of the insulin producing cells may be gone. And the remaining, the good news is the remaining beta cells are inhibited by excess saturated fatty acids, so they make less insulin. But when you reverse that, without the excess sat fat and lower calories, even over eight weeks, the beta cells can start responding again and producing insulin in response to need. And this greatly relieves, of course, high blood sugar. There's one more way that we can make saturated fats in our own bodies, which is not desirable. Uh, we normally make a small amount of saturated fatty acids from sugar in our bodies. And this is to meet needs, but we should not ever take them in. When we eat excess sugar in a diet, a typical soda can contain 12 teaspoons of sugar in one soda. And some people eat, drink a six pack or more a day. Uh, when this blood sugar is uh, burned, no problem. Sometimes it's taken into the cells and made into glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose, blood sugar. Uh, you can think of it as a little suitcase. It can hold thousands of glucose molecules inside the cell. This is great. So when we start running, we have glycogen in our muscle cells and we don't really need blood glucose for a while because we can run on that stored glucose. All of this is good, but when we filled up our reservoirs of sugar storage, then the excess sugar is turned into palmitic acid, which is one of the most dangerous saturated fatty acids. This increases insulin resistance, especially in the liver where it's made. And this raises fasting blood sugar levels because the insulin is not seen by the liver because of insulin resistance. So the liver keeps making sugar when it shouldn't, when it should stop. Okay, where do we find these saturated fatty acids that are so damaging? Coconut oil, two teaspoons, 24 grams. But wait a minute, our limit's 12 grams a day. So if you did have two tablespoons of coconut oil, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, vegan ice creams have uh, coconut oil in them. And if you eat much of them, you can easily get 24 grams of saturated fat. So read the labels carefully and uh, make sure that your serving size of saturated fat, say in uh, vegan ice cream or cheese or 
meats or whatever you're eating that is even it's plant-based, but if they add coconut oil, try and get that serving size down to four or absolute maximum five. Spam, 18 grams. Okay, way, way over. And that's a half a can. Now uh, here in Hawaii, uh, spam is called the fifth food group, jokingly, by Hawaiians who often eat more than half a can. Cheddar cheese and other cheese is a big contributor to saturated fatty acids, probably the biggest contributor in most diets. Fast food cheeseburger has nine, there's not much room over nine to get to your 12. Milk, yogurt, ice cream, any dairy products are often contributors. What about foods that are low in saturated fatty acids? A vegetable curry made with tofu, two grams, fine. You can eat that all day, never get over your target levels for saturated fats of 12 per day. Tofu is low, silk, soy milk, whole cup is only half a gram. Pinto beans, all kinds of beans are very, very low in saturated fats. I would say that beans are perhaps one of the best foods for diabetes because they're very slow releasing sugar, they have excellent fatty acids that are needed, very low in the saturated, saturated fatty acids that are not needed. Eat all you want of vegetables, beans, nuts, whole grains, and fruit. They all have very little saturated fatty acids with the only exception, the uh, coconut, that uh, have high saturated fatty acids. But all of these beautiful foods, you can eat all you want and keep your saturated fats low. I do also want to mention trivalent chromium. Chromium is uh, found, for instance, in nutritional yeast and whole grains, green vegetables are good sources. Chromium improves insulin sensitivity. It increases, remember I talked about the glucose transporter four, that is actually what gets the glucose out of the blood and into the cells. Well, higher chromium levels seem to increase this. So it gets the glucose into the cells where it's needed. And this is from the Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry, one of my favorites. Here's a little uh, graph that I made. Uh, I wanna give credit to McGraw-Hill. It's from my book, Vitamins and Minerals Demystified. Insulin docks onto an insulin receptor. Before it does, there's glucose outside the cell and chromium outside the cell. Once it docks on, there's a small arrow of glucose going into the cell. Then the chromium is taken into the cell and then you get a large arrow of glucose into the cell. So it increases the glucose into the cell, effectively reducing insulin resistance. These are the West Maui Mountains and just a little break before I go on to another section. I wanna tell you about some trials, clinical trials that took real people and attempted to reverse their diabetes. In the first study here, fasting sugar was 282. Now, just to give you a reference there, a good range of blood sugar is 70 to 90 milligrams per deciliter. You get very far under 70 and your blood sugar is too low, it makes it difficult to think. If you get over 90 up to 100, at about 100 to 130, this is usually defined as prediabetes. Over 130 is diabetes. These people started out at 282, so they were uncontrolled diabetes, very high. And it was lowered to 89, which is in the non-diabetic range. It took 10 months to do this. And I cite the studies down below. In another study, a plant diet reduced fasting blood sugar. It got it from 164, which is very high, to 128, which is just under diabetes and into prediabetes again. Uh, instead of calling it prediabetes, you could call it post-diabetes because they, they moved down there in five months. In that trial, the, there's a system for judging how much hemoglobin in blood, a blood protein, is damaged by excess blood sugar and it's called HGA1C or glycated hemoglobin. And it's supposed to be under six to be non-diabetic to show that you're not damaging yourself from high blood sugar. In this trial in five months, the glycated hemoglobin went from 8.1, which is quite a high level, down to 6.8, which is in the lower range for diabetes. So it was greatly improved. 
Now, the fourth study here is from Brenda Davis in the Majuro study, where she managed to reduce fasting sugar from 236, again, a very high level, down to 161 milligrams per deciliter in two weeks, in just two weeks. This is on average. Some of the people in the study did much better. Neil Barnard, a medical doctor, did a study on a plant-based diet and the, it was 22 weeks. The glucose went down to just below diabetes. People lost about 13 pounds. Their cholesterol went down quite nicely and triglycerides went down too. So just during this five month study, people changed, they got better. This is what we want. Now, this study was kind of radical, okay, because they basically the people ate water, vegetables, and a nutrient drink and nothing else. So they're getting 600 calories. This is a lot like fasting. But their blood sugar went from 165, definitely diabetic, to 106, which is almost below the 100 dividing line to not diabetic or pre-diabetic at all. What's interesting about this trial is that the beta cells were revived and able to produce more insulin. Also, the sensitivity of the liver to insulin was restored so that the liver can stop making blood sugar when we don't need it. Blood sugar is already high. Now, this study is on the uh, nurse's health study, and they followed them for 16 years, uh, 85,000 nurses. Now, my problem with these nurses' health studies is that really the nurses all eat very similarly. Uh, there aren't a lot of real plant-based nurses and there aren't a lot of nurses who eat really terrible diet. They have some health consciousness too. So the studies are valuable, uh, but not too definitive. They found though that the nurses with a poor diet, obesity, lack of exercise and smoking accounted for 91% of the risk of diabetes in these people. I do think that diet is the most important factor, but of course, exercise is very good. It, naturally, it burns blood sugar, right? Gets your, gets your blood sugar lower as you get more exercise. Okay, now I wanna talk about 10 steps to reverse diabetes. A study was done in the island of Majuro. Now, I was not associated with this study, though I am in contact with Brenda Davis, who did the study there. And I have been to Majuro and spent some time there, coincidentally. A beautiful island. Uh, it's a coral atoll. So the highest point on the island is about six feet. Uh, nice people, really sweet people there. Diabetes is rampant in the Marshall Islands. And from the same reasons that it's rampant in America and elsewhere, not just are they more susceptible, but the junk food that is available, that's cheap and tasty and quick is very available there too. And fresh food is very difficult to get because they don't grow much fresh food there. It needs to be barged in from Hawaii, which makes it expensive and uh, rarely very fresh. The transformation over two weeks and the people in this trial and I'll tell you what they did, the 10 steps that they did. The blood glucose was reduced from 236 to 161. That's a big reduction. Weight went down a bit, cholesterol went down pretty well. And also they were just plain healthier. But I think what's even more telling is that starting off in the 30 people, three of them were taking insulin, but two weeks later did not need insulin. Well, that's really interesting. 27 of the 30 people in the study were taking medications to lower blood sugar, typically metformin. And after two weeks, only five still needed these drugs to lower their blood sugar. Isn't that amazing how many were able to drop their drugs? Cholesterol medication and 13 were on it. And only one at the end needed this medication. I, I think that's just remarkable. High blood pressure medication, also 11 people were taking it and only one needed it after two weeks. Isn't that amazing how much healthier these people got during this two weeks? So what did they do? I'm going to tell you all about the study and the steps that they took to do it. But first, this uh, peaceful scene from a Sea of Cortez picture of boats at anchor. 
in the early morning. So what they did in this uh, study, clinical trial, they restored insulin sensitivity by reducing saturated fats. They also eliminated quick carbohydrates. Now this is tough to do because they're fun. Everybody loves a sugar high, but they eliminated this in the diet. And they provided dietary antioxidants. Now antioxidants come from plants, not animal products. So to the extent that you're eating animal products like meat or cheese, you're not getting the antioxidants you need to protect your arteries and your eyes and your kidneys and your brain. These are absolutely necessary. So they made sure that people got those. The antioxidants also really protect you from the damage from high blood sugar. It's crucial to get that. The first step in this diet is to minimize refined carbohydrates. Oh, many people in America and in, in Maduro too, uh, which is actually a protectorate of the US. They had an actual post office there, US post office in there. 90% uh, of the carbohydrates in the diets were from white flour and sugar and other white rice, fast releasing carbohydrates. The carbohydrates, I don't know if you've noticed, but they promote overeating because you don't really satisfied uh, by eating these empty carbohydrates. I mean, if you dipped into a box of cereal and just kept eating them and eating them, it seems like you'd never get full because they're not satisfying what you need. And also the excess carbohydrates are turned into saturated fats that increase disease resistance. So this uh, is perhaps an exaggerated picture of uh, how much sugary beverages people are getting. But one of the main sources of excess calories and sugar is sugary drinks. And the uh, high fructose corn syrup or sugar are very undesirable foods. White rice is a big problem in Hawaii and the Marshall Islands, less so in the US, but you do still find it in uh, restaurants a lot and a lot of people eat white rice. It's very quickly absorbed to raise blood sugars to levels that are difficult to reduce unless you have really well-functioning insulin system. And of course, white flour products are what's eaten in America. If you look on the shelves of a typical fast food store or, or restaurant uh, market, you'll see that white flour products are everywhere and you can just call them junk food because that's what they're worth. The refined products look good, they taste good, they're very quick to eat, but they've lost much of the goodness. Now I mentioned three things here, but they've lost a lot of other things too. 78% of their fiber, and fiber is essential. I'll mention that as one of the 10 steps. We're on step one now, re reducing quick carbohydrates. 98% of their vitamin E is lost. Wheat actually has vitamin E in the germ and is valuable. You may remember wheat germ is a health food that was taken principally because of the high vitamin E levels. Manganese, a necessary nutrient and mineral, 82% reduced. Slow grains, grains that absorb slowly. These are perfect. When you eat, for instance, wild rice or brown rice, it goes into your stomach, into your intestines and slowly releases glucose. So over 15 minutes, you get a little bit of glucose into your bloodstream, but you're burning glucose over that 15 minutes in your bloodstream. So you come out even. Your beta cells are ready to make insulin, but they don't need to because the blood sugar never gets too high. The next 15 minutes, more blood sugar is entered into your bloodstream, more is burned up, and so on for hours. It really doesn't raise your blood sugar. It keeps it at a steady pace, which is what's desirable. We don't want blood sugar too low. We don't want it too high. Now, broken whole grains like steel-cut oats are excellent, slowly absorbing, and uh, you can get them pre-cooked so that they cook up very quickly, or you can soak them too. Rolled whole grains like rolled oats and rolled barley are almost as good as whole intact grains and very much more convenient to eat. And they are still slow absorbing. When you get to shredded whole grains like shredded wheat, 
these are a little quicker. They're not quite as slow. So I made them white instead of green. And ground up whole grains, even if it's whole grain flour, and it's really whole flour. Did you know on labels, it is defined that if it says wheat flour, it means white flour. Isn't that interesting? So be sure it says whole wheat flour, not wheat flour. If it says wheat flour, you're getting the rapidly absorbable white flour. But what about fast grains? Well, white rice is very fast. And it's interesting, corn is an excellent food, but corn flakes are very rapidly absorbed. When they're flaked like that, you get a quick sugar high. Not to mention that breakfast cereal, or cere excuse me, breakfast cereals average about 52% sugar. So that is just amazing. People are pouring breakfast cereal, cere <laughs> I seem to have trouble with the word cereal. People are pouring breakfast cereal into their child's bowl, not realizing that they're pouring sugar into the bowl. Now, when you eat spaghetti or white bread or cake or cookies, these are very fast absorbing. And these are not included in this diet that reverse diabetes. Puffed grains, such as puffed wheat, rice, millet, even uh, the crackers that are made out of puffed rice are really too fast absorbing. Luckily, they don't have as many calories as some other foods, but still we don't want fast absorbing grains. This lady is a wonderful lady who was part of the uh, trial there in Majuro. She says, when I joined, I cannot lift my hands above my head without significant pain. Now I am pain free. My cholesterol and triglycerides are dropped to normal. Sugars are almost normal too. I've lost weight and feel like a new person. I'm off all medications, it is unbelievable. I know that these examples are not really science, but to see the face of someone who has reversed diabetes, I think is helpful and inspirational because it's not easy to change your diet. It's not easy to avoid these quick releasing carbohydrates like donuts and cookies and cake and all those things. Okay, that was step one. Now step two is to maximize whole plant carbohydrates. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans all have these antioxidants. One of the best antioxidants is the carotenoids that are colorful. They're usually seen as either yellow or orange, and they're also in green vegetables. Carotenoids are lipid-based antioxidants that protect our cell membranes. They protect our brains. They protect our arteries, and they're found in whole plant foods. Carotenoids are not found in any animal products, such as meat or cheese or fish or any of these other things. Another great classification of antioxidants is polyphenols, and they're found in whole plant foods. And there are many subcategories, like quercetin is the most common one eaten in diets. They're anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Very, very good. The lowest rates of chronic disease anywhere in the world are found in diets that are high in these slow releasing carbohydrates. So I want to emphasize that you can't say carbs are good. You can't say carbs are bad. There are good carbs and bad carbs, okay? We have these slow releasing carbohydrates that are loaded with antioxidants and nutrients, or we have the quick releasing carbohydrates that are devoid of good nutrients. This little graph shows that the first bump is fast food that absorbs quickly, and the second food is slow food. The total graph spans three hours, and you can see that you get a nice, steady blood sugar from a slow-releasing carbohydrate, but a quick burst and then a slump from the fast-releasing carbohydrates. Now, there are two ways to measure carbohydrate uh, speed in getting sugar into the bloodstream. One way is called glycemic index. This is inaccurate, outdated, and should never be used. It does not represent how much blood sugar gets into the bloodstream from a serving of a food. So it's completely inaccurate, and yet doctors and dietitians continue to use this. Even research studies continue to use it sometimes, although more and more I'm seeing that the much more accurate glycemic load is working. Foods with a low glycemic load 
vegetables and beans are the best. A little bit of white potatoes, although I prefer the colored potatoes like purple sweet potatoes, and a little bit of grains if they're in the whole intact or slow releasing form. And then we want to get food that looked more like that picture of green vegetables and beans and uh, nuts and seeds are great too. So this is low glycemic load. Now, I wanna tell you more about why the glycemic index is so inaccurate. The glycemic index classifies these beautiful watermelon slices as being way too high, way too rapidly absorbed. And it's true that watermelon does have some sugar and it is rapidly absorbed. However, watermelon's 98.5% water. There's not much sugar in them. They, look, they gave people 50 grams of sugar as watermelon in the glycemic index. Well, nobody can eat that much. It's just too much. However, when you test glycemic load of watermelon, it's very low and quite acceptable for diabetics because there's very little sugar in a serving of watermelon. So this is where you need to look at the glycemic load and not the glycemic index. A whole cup of watermelon has only 45 calories, even though it's rapidly digested and it's gotten into the bloodstream fairly quickly, there's just a little bit there, not enough to cause a big insulin spike or a big blood sugar spike. I made this graph up to show how low fruits are in glycemic load. And by glycemic load, I mean that fruits very slowly increase blood sugar because I'm talking about whole fruit here, not fruit juice, not dried fruit, but whole fruit. The complex nature of the fruit slows down the absorption of the sugar. And of course the antioxidants protect you dramatically. Now mango and banana are only medium here and would not be recommended for diabetics. But isn't it interesting, oranges, papayas, grapes, pears, apples, all of these are low on the glycemic load index so they don't increase blood sugar quickly. They slowly release blood sugar and they don't contain that much sugar in the first place. Sweet cherries and strawberries are even lower. I like to put sweet cherries in my oatmeal and that is a way to get slow releasing uh, blood sugar, but a, a lot of flavor and a lot of anthocyanins in those sweet cherries, which protect our brain and other parts of our bodies. Peaches, grapefruits, plums, all of these are very slow releasing. This study looked at fruit lowering the risk of diabetes and blueberries lowered the risk 33% and all of the other fruit did too. Now again, not juice and not uh, any other form of fruit like apple pie. I'm not talking about apple pie, I'm talking about eating an apple. Uh, it is a dangerous mistake to limit fruit especially the low glycemic load fruit on a diabetic diet. Yeah, this is exactly what doctors and dietitians are telling people with diabetes. They say, don't eat fruit, it has sugar. But more accurately, people should limit their high glycemic load fruit, but not limit their low glycemic load fruit, which includes berries, which are extremely beneficial. And of course, the antioxidants in the fruit prevent the complications from diabetes, complications, arterial damage, brain damage, eye damage, kidney damage. This is what the antioxidants do. So I would say that you may wanna rethink fruit. Uh, you can read this study in the British Medical Journal uh, that talked about how fruit lowers the risk, does not raise the risk of diabetes and it's quite protective as well. Here's another story, uh, Lorac Lorac, a uh, young man, only 38 years old when he got into the Majuro trial, a pilot whose medical certificate was denied. He became a participant in the diabetes wellness program. He completely changed his diet and began a daily exercise program. He looks quite fit now. On his last physical, I was told that I'm fully recovered and my pilot's medical certificate was reapproved. Fasting blood sugar is below 90 milligrams per deciliter. Remember, that's well under even prediabetes. That's normal with no medications. He no longer has diabetes. He has his life back and his health back. 
And I think it's inspiring to look at people. Laura Clark, he looks disciplined, doesn't he? He managed to not eat the stuff that gives you diabetes and continues it. And he managed to reverse it. Number four on a number of 10, high fiber diet. The standard recommended amount of diet per day is 20 grams per day, but we really need more because the fiber, for instance, in fruit or beans or other whole plant foods slows the absorption of sugar. It also, fiber makes you feel full when you eat it and it improves digestion. Constipation is a problem for many people with diabetes because people with diabetes eat food devoid of fiber and high in fast releasing carbohydrates. Fiber also has a nice side effect in that it ushers cholesterol out of the body, helping to reduce blood cholesterol, remembering that it is heart disease that kills most people with diabetes, a good idea not to have too much cholesterol and its associated risk of atherosclerosis, heart attacks, and strokes. Now, fiber can be separated into different types. We have the coarse fiber that seems like sawdust, uh, cellulose, but what we're talking about here is viscous fiber. And viscous fiber has uh, guargers and gums and pectins and mucilage. It's soft and very nice for controlling blood sugar. And it, it's like uh, beans, barley, oats, and flax seeds are very helpful for this type of fiber. Of course, all of your whole plant foods like nuts and beans and vegetables, are, they're all really helpful for this. Now, I want to distinguish between low fiber foods and zero fiber foods, okay? Refined carbohydrates like white rice and white flour, uh, junk food in general, has very low fiber, but not none. If you want no fiber, meat, poultry, fish, pork, dairy products, eggs, sugar, and oil, these have no fiber at all. They're also devoid of antioxidants, and this is a big problem. I know that egg yolks have a tiny amount of lutein, uh, a carotenoid antioxidant, but it's truly too little to do any good. Number five is to reduce high fat diets is to get just the right amount of fat. Uh, you don't want to be like this kitty and get overweight. Too much fat increases oxidative damage, free radical damage. It contributes to insulin resistance, as I mentioned, with the saturated fat. And of course, too much fat helps to increase weight gain. The target zone for total fat should be 20 to 25% of calories. And in this diet, refined oils and spreads were eliminated, okay? No olive oil, no margarine, no butter. Uh, none of these things were used on this diet. Uh, I also eat like that. And I uh, have a book that I wrote called Fats and Oils Demystified. It's available on my website, drsteveblake.com, if you want a good textbook on fats and oils. And I realized that really it's best to get your fats from whole nuts, seeds, nut butters, avocados, whole olives, rather than the oil, because when they make the oil, it becomes rancid, it uh, loses its fiber, of course, all of it, and many good nutrients like vitamin E are greatly diminished in the oil. Why not get the good stuff on all of it? Number six, probably the most important factor, low saturated fat. Uh, below 7% of calories, even below 5% is better. If you avoid animal fats and coconut fat, you're going to be well on your way. When I look at uh, diets and where the saturated fats are found, cheese is the highest source of saturated fats in diets, uh, 24 grams typically, but you're only allowed 11 or 12 per day. Uh, hamburgers, bologna, spam, milk, butter, these are all very high in saturated fats. And on the left, I do note that they're often high in cholesterol. Eggs, which only have four grams of saturated fat for two eggs, has 420 milligrams of cholesterol, which is way over the limit. And when cholesterol is oxidized as in cooked eggs and further oxidized in the body, it forms oxysterols, oxidized cholesterol, that damages your arteries and damages your brain, creates more neuroinflammation to damage memory. <laughs>
I want to quote this young lady here. Uh, when I joined this program, I was very skeptical. I mean, just look at her face. But very quickly, I started to feel better. The cramps in my legs disappeared, and I long, no longer had to get up during the night. My sugars kept dropping and are now normal without any medication. My last lab tests show that I'm no longer diabetic. People can hardly believe what has happened to me. Number seven out of 10, no trans fats. Now, I think it's fascinating that when people talk about trans fats, even a lot of scientists, they don't realize where in the diet the trans fats come from. They're found in partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, yes. And look on labels to see if the food has any of that. If it does, I would consider rejecting it myself. It's also found in beef and dairy products because cows biohydrogenate the oils into trans fatty acids. In various diets, the amount from hydrogenated vegetable oil versus the amount from beef and dairy may come out even. Some diets have more from one, some from the other. The actual trans fatty acids in both of these sources are the same. Although from dairy products, there's a little more of the vicinic acid and from the hydrogenated oil, there's a little more of the elytic acid. The trans fats, just like saturated fats, change the flexibility, permeability, the fluidity of cell membranes so that fewer insulin receptors are available. They reduce the, uh, they raise the blood cholesterol, increasing the risk of heart disease and increased inflammation too. Trans fats are found in many processed foods like these shown. Um, margarine or butter have trans fats, crackers, cookies, cakes. So many foods contain these things. And also beef, hamburgers, uh, and dairy products too. Now, number eight out of 10 is to get enough omega-3s in the diet. The omega-3 fatty acids have the opposite effect from trans fatty acids or saturated fatty acids. They increase fluidity of the cell membrane, making it easier for the insulin to work and get sugar out of your bloodstream and into your cells where you want it. One tablespoon of ground up flaxseed and a handful of walnuts can supply enough omega-3 from plant sources to provide you with a, enough for one day. We need about three grams of omega-3 fatty acids per day. And I also mentioned that we need to limit our omega-6 fatty acids so that the omega-3 fatty acids can be made into EPA and DHA, which are the effective forms, eicosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid. So walnuts, a serving can provide almost three grams, the amount you need per day. Um, a tablespoon of flax seeds can provide almost three grams. Uh, hemp seeds are lower. And I do wanna mention that leafy greens, while wonderful foods and just full of great nutrition, unfortunately only 0.1 gram per cup. And I know people say, well, I get my omega-3s from leafy greens. If so, they're eating a bucket full a day, <laughs> which is hardly possible. So people say omega-3s are good, so why not just eat fish oil? Well, this study that came out in Diabetes Care, I've read and reread several times because is it possible that the pollutants found in fish raise the risk of diabetes 38 times? Apparently so. The study seems well done. Persistent organic pollutants found in fish include DDT, uh, PCBs, which are polychlorinated biphenols, polychlorinated diphenyl ethers, or polybrominated, excuse me, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, sometimes these are hard to say, organochlorine pesticides, very common. And the fish bioaccumulate these and become a very high source. Those who had more of these pollutants had 38 times the risk of diabetes. This is a very high level. So where are these PCBs that damage us so much found? Uh, fish oil, number one, fish, number two, eggs, number three, dairy products, baby foods, sadly, and even beef. Vegetable oil has a small amount, but fruits, vegetables, and cereals, a tiny, tiny amount. So I would recommend that you get your fats and oils more from 
these plant sources, whole plant sources. Now, number nine out of 10 in the study that reversed diabetes, high levels of plant antioxidants. This reduces the damage to the eyes and the kidneys, the heart attacks and strokes. It's very, very important to get these antioxidants. The antioxidant status when they looked at people with diabetes was very low, especially when blood sugar was uncontrolled. Some of these studies I mentioned, the blood sugar was over 200 and it needs to be under 100. And so they were actually burning up their antioxidants and they have a higher need than other people for antioxidants, which are found in whole plant foods. The risk of prediabetes was reduced 90% with more whole plant foods in this 2018 study. Diets rich in fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and legumes, and other plant foods protected against prediabetes. Now, I mentioned polyphenols. There are many, many polyphenols in whole plant foods, and these are antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. There are phytoestrogens like genistein, which is highly anti-inflammatory. Sulforaphane is found in cruciferous vegetables like kale, cabbage, broccoli, and uh, bro broccoli sprouts, of course, a very high source of sulforaphane, very, very protective. Plant sterols are antioxidant and reduce inflammation. So basically there are many, many things in these whole plants that are antioxidant and prevent prediabetes or reduce the risk of in the study. I analyze diets. This is a standard American diet, which can be abbreviated SAD. When you look at the vitamin C, it's much lower than the need. You look at the vitamin E, much lower than the need. Did you know 93% of Americans don't even get the very minimal RDA for vitamin E? And you can see in this that Americans are not getting it. Switch to a plant antioxidants, you're getting great antioxidants. Vitamin A in the form of carotenes or carotenoids. Carotenes are the ones that are converted to vitamin A. Vitamin C is very high. Vitamin E was nice and high. On this plant-based diet, you're getting really good antioxidants to protect just those parts of your body that need it. So that's why I was included in this study and included. The analysis that I did here, I did with this diet doctor software, which I designed myself. And I use it myself all the time. I want to look up a food and see how good it is. I use the diet doctor. If I want to analyze a diet to see if people are getting too much saturated fatty acids, too little vitamin E, just the right amount of vitamin C and all the other nutritional vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, protein, carbohydrates, fiber, all of that stuff. I think it's essential. This is available on my website if you want to analyze your own diet or you can also make arrangements to send your diet to me and I can run it through for you. Plant antioxidants in this study were maximized by getting nine servings a day of fruits and vegetables, two servings per day of beans. Beans are very important to give satisfaction. When you eat beans, you feel full. Nuts also are satisfying and were included one serving per day and seeds also one serving per day. They're loaded with nutrients. Whole grains were three servings per day, but these are in the whole intact form and not flaked or ground up. Well, what about supplements for antioxidants? We should plan to get most of our antioxidants from food, from whole plant food. Vitamin C is powerful. Vitamin E can only be whole in the RRR alpha tocopherol form with the other gamma, beta, and delta tocopherols. Unfortunately, supplements on the market, if you go in a store or a health food store and you try and buy a vitamin E or a multivitamin with vitamin E, it's going to be the synthetic form, which does not say RRR, alpha tocopherol. The synthetic form is seven eighths fake so that your body is being protected, but not protected. It, it thinks it's being protected with fake vitamin E that doesn't work. So I would counsel against buying vitamin E unless it is in this form. And current guidelines for labeling require to have this on the label if it's real. I made a special supplement for people in our dementia trial called brain and body food 
that's only available on my website. I just supply it to people who need it to improve their nutrient status. Uh, but I take it myself to improve my antioxidant levels. But of course, number one, diet. Number two is a supplement. It just supplements a diet. It doesn't take the place of a good diet. So number 10 and last on the list of things that were done is to lower dietary contaminants. The worst offenders are in, found in meat. There are pesticides, hormones, you know, bovine growth hormone is added and it's recombinant bovine growth hormone. So genetically engineered bovine growth hormone is actually clipped to the ears of the cattle and slowly introduced. Uh, there are heavy metals, the PCBs and DDTs and dioxins that I mentioned, these are found in meat, chicken, pork, and fish. Also fried foods can contain advanced glycation end products and oxysterols. Both are very damaging to the body. There are many other pro-inflammatory molecules like advanced glycation end products, abbreviated AGEs here, that are found in barbecued, broiled, or fried meat, and also found in aged cheese. They increase inflammation and damage to the blood vessels and the brain and the kidneys. Now, if you cook food at high temperatures, you get all of these terrible things. Acrylamides, which are found when you cook to uh, dark brown uh, toast, for instance, uh, potato chips, french fries. Heterocyclic amines are found in cooked meats. They're highly ca cancer promoting. Polycyclic aromatic, hi aromatic hydrocarbons are also cancer promoting and found in cooked meat. I'll talk a little more about advanced glycation end products. There's two ways they're formed. Uh, when people have high blood sugar for long periods of time, the sugar glycates the hemoglobin and creates this measure, in fact, of diabetes called glycated hemoglobin, which should be under six if you don't have diabetes. So it can be formed in the blood. It also is formed in food when it's cooked at high temperatures or stored, such as an aged cheese. It's found in most meat, fish, chicken, and pork because most of that is barbecued or broiled. Uh, typically in fast food places, they broil it or uh, fry it. Once the food is eaten with these things, about half of the advanced glycation end products are absorbed into the bloodstream where they actively promote inflammation. And the type of damage that you get from high blood sugar is directly related to the formation and the eating of these advanced glycation end products. There's a receptor on the brain for these two, so they go in the brain and increase inflammation and free radical damage killing brain cells as well. Best to avoid these. The program in Modro also included a little bit of exercise. They did some walking, they had classes of aerobics or boxing circuit training. They had some cardio machines and weights and uh, therabands, which are kind of elastic uh, weights. I have to say that the people in the Marshall Islands really need more exercise as well as more fresh fruit. Uh, I could tell you stories about that, but it, it's true that exercise is very helpful as a part of a healthy program to reverse diabetes. What happened? Pain disappeared. Disappeared. Didn't just get reduced. In the joints and the arms and especially the legs. Leg cramps at nights are very common with diets low in magnesium. And uh, magnesium is found in green leafy vegetables and many of these other plant foods. People no longer needed leg massages at night to ease the cramps. Increased energy. That's because the glucose, the blood sugar is getting in the cells where it's needed instead of in the bloodstream where it becomes damaging. Walking became easier and people didn't have to get up many times at night to go to the bathroom. Polyuria is one of the early symptoms of diabetes and people are no longer constipated. Another common problem with this diet. So I'll show you this one more time. In the Modulo study, insulin went from three people out of 30 to zero. Uh, drugs for Reducing blood sugar went from 27 to five in two weeks. Cholesterol drugs, 13 to one. High blood pressure pills, 11 to one. This man says, and I'll quote him, I suffered a stroke because of my diabetes and was in a wheelchair, could not walk. 
After joining the diabetes wellness program for six months, I got out of my wheelchair and I'm walking on my own again. I'm healthier than I've been in many years. The program has given me more than I ever thought was possible. It's providing hope to the people of the Marshall Islands. Fred Heine is an inspiration. Here's the problem. I've seen people reverse their diabetes. If they continue the program, it stays reversed. But if they go back, they go back to the former habits, they go back to the diabetes. So the program needs to be continued for continued benefits. And this means that your cook and your shopper and everything have to be on board with you to do this. You have to do it yourself because you control your diet. No one else really does. Not your doctor or your nurse or your dietitian. You need to control your own diet. And uh, so I'm going to conclude my talk now with a picture of my book, Diabetes Breakthrough. I make it available for under $10 in electronic format on my website so anyone can afford it. And the paper on diabetes and saturated fat is open source and can be downloaded. Just type the title in uh, Google Scholar and you can download a PDF of that. Uh, how excess dietary uh, saturated fats uh, increase insulin resistance is the name of that one. So I'd like to now uh, turn it over to you, Ben. Uh, we're ready for questions. Thank you very much. Wow, Steve, thank you so, so much. Just incredibly <laughs> thorough as always and <laughs> so you. helpful. And, and your work is, is life-changing, so thank you. Um, Again, uh, drsteveblake.com. That's the best place to get your books as well? Yes, that's the only place to get my books. I am currently boycotting Amazon. Got it. Okay. Um, we get that. And so now, yes, it's time for some Q&A, and we appreciate that. I see some hands being raised already, which is terrific. We want to make sure that our audience understands, in case you don't know how to Raise your hand or why would we have you raise your hand? We typically don't take questions directly from the chat box here at The Real Truth About Health. So we ask everyone to raise their hands. If you don't know how to do that, you have different Zoom tabs on your Zoom window. One of them is called your reactions tab. You click on your reactions tab and then a bunch of emojis will actually pop up. And when they do, you click on the raise hand function. And we'll see your raised hands come in. And again, I see a bunch already. People are excited to speak with you, Steve. And so with that, um, I'll call on your names one by one, your first name, and I'll unmute you. So let's start with Ruth. Welcome, Hi. Ruth. Hi, this has been really fascinating. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, here are my questions. Um, can you use the coconut oil on your skin? I don't know how much of it would be absorbed and like uh, everywhere on the body. And uh, the other thing is the sweeteners. Now, I don't know if I missed this or not. If you talked about it, stevia, a uh, swerve, uh, 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 the, sh the actual coconut sugar. Now, I don't have diabetes at this. Uh, th th thank God right now. Okay, but, good. Uh, uh, let me address that. First of all, the coconut sugar, I would not recommend. It is really a lot like plain sugar. And I think it's fascinating that you asked about coconut oil rubbed on the body. At first, I thought, well, this, this is fine, right? You're not eating it. But think about it. If you put a tablespoon of coconut oil on a countertop and come back the next morning, what's there? A <laughs> same thing. It doesn't change, right? You rub it on your skin, and later, it's absorbed, isn't it? And I did check, and uh, fats are absorbed through your skin, do go into your bloodstream, where they actually raise cholesterol in your bloodstream, and increase your risk of both heart attacks and strokes and diabetes. So it depends how much you rub in your bloodstream. But if you do something like a quarter cup of coconut oil over your entire body, another interesting thing happens. You get a lot of excess calories without much nutrition at all. So you're increasing weight gain as well from rubbing it on your body. Isn't that fascinating? Now, as far as the sweetener, stevia is a great sweetener, non-caloric. Um, and if you like it, that's a, a good way to go. Uh, so I hope I've answered your question there. Thank you, Ruth. Good questions. Thanks very much, Steve. And up next, we have Monty. And welcome, Monty. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the coconut um, powder, 
how much safer is it? And what's the best source for vitamin E? Um, not, not supplements, but best food source for vitamin E supplement. But if you use the coconut flakes, uh, is it any safer? Or the powder? Yes, actually, the coconut flakes are a lot safer if you just eat a few of them. You don't wind up getting much saturated fat at all. They're, they're so chewy and flavorful that if you're really craving coconut flavor, say on a salad or something, sprinkle a few flakes, keep it light, and no problem there. Uh, you also can read the package or do an analysis and find out how much saturated fat is in, say, a tablespoon of coconut flakes. It's not too much. Uh, compared with the oil where it's way too much. And what was your other question? Of course, what's the best uh, source for vitamin E? Oh, oh, okay, great. Uh, vitamin E comes in different tocopherols. For instance, in the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, which I designed and ran and was very successful in reversing uh, dementia. And Monty, I believe you were at that lecture just uh, about a week ago. Uh, what we used a ounce of ground up walnuts and we use an ounce of ground up sunflower seeds. The sunflower seeds provide vitamin E in the alpha tocopherol form and the walnuts provide vitamin E in the gamma tocopherol form. Walnuts have the added benefit of having omega-3 fatty acids as well. So those are two good sources. Other nuts and seeds are also having vitamin E and can be used as well. As I mentioned, there's only two that don't have vitamin E, just macadamia nuts and coconuts. Thank you, Monty. Thanks again, Steve. And now we have Benny. Welcome, Benny. Good morning. Since your program involves mainly eating fresh fruits and vegetables, is it fair to say there would be no diabetes if someone eats just fresh fruits and vegetables? Or another way, the cause of diabetes is eating anything other than fresh fruits and vegetables? Well, uh, just eating fresh fruits and vegetables is not going to be very satisfying to your stomach or your nutrient needs. So that, which is why the addition of at least a couple servings of beans of some sort per day, uh, you, you could, if you want the easiest thing, maybe soy milk, um, or edamame beans are great. Uh, there's so many kinds of beans, uh, out there, any of them are really good. It's also important to include nuts and seeds with your fruits and vegetables. And of course, we do want to eat the lower glycemic load fruits and vegetables, especially if we're already diabetic, which would include mostly the berries, things like pears and apples that don't have a lot of sugar and it's released slowly. So a, a complete diet could also include whole intact grains, which helps with caloric needs. Because just fruits and vegetables, you're not likely to get the number of calories you need to stay satisfied and keep your weight levels up. Thank you for an interesting question. Thanks, Benny. And up next, we have Ray. Hi, Ray. Hi, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, doctor. I have questions. One is uh, my wife had been using the flex seed oil and I've been using the flax seed whole and ground up sometime, which would you say is the best? Well, as my wife likes to say, there's good, better, and best. And the, the best would be freshly ground up whole organic flax seeds, because did you know some flax seeds are genetically modified? So that would definitely be the best. Uh, however, flaxseed oil, if it's extracted cold pressed, um, it's very hard to find a good flaxseed oil. It may not be thoroughly rancid. The problem is that flax seeds are very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, which have three points where they can become oxidized or rancid. Now, rancid oils can increase uh, cancer risk, actually. Uh, so it's best to eat them uh, freshly ground would be the best way. Ground up every few days and stored in a closed container in the refrigerator would be second best. And also supplying your omega-3s would be the, um, the flaxseed oil. But as I mentioned, it has a one drawback of possibly being, likely being a little bit rancid. So thank you for your question, Ray. Thanks, Steve. Up next, we have Stephen. And okay, welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Thank you, doctor, for getting up at three o'clock in the morning. That's so nice of you. 
and um, just a great body of life research. And I just appreciate everything you've done. So um, I guess my question would be, you didn't mention, not that I eat it, but you didn't mention palm oil. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about palm oil and maybe it's not so good for us either. Oh, yes, yes. And actually, I, I didn't get up at 3 a.m. I got up at 1 a.m. <laughs> but somehow I feel OK. Uh, so palm oil, uh, there's two types of palm oil. And, and again, I refer you to my own textbook, uh, Fats and Oils Demystified, uh, to look at the constituents of these. One is the palm fruit oil, the palm oil, and the other is palm kernel oil. And they're different in composition. The palm kernel oil is almost identical to coconut oil. So I would say never on that one. The palm oil itself, actually, if it's unprocessed, has some interesting components such as tocotrienols. Tocotrienols are in the vitamin E family, and especially topically, they can be very antioxidant and helpful. It still does have too much saturated fat to take much of it. So you'll need to check the amount of palm oil that you're eating uh, and check how much you're getting of saturated fat from other sources, keep it below 12 grams a day, and then you can include a tiny amount of palm oil. But I'm not sure that I would ever recommend that. But if you're really enthusiastic about it and you can fit it in your saturated fatty acid budget, uh, maybe just a little bit would be okay. Thank, thank you for your question. Thanks, Steve. And up next, we have somebody with the first initial G. Hi, G. Hi. Um, sorry, I, I, it's Gretchen. I, I don't know why I put it that way. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, my family uh, refuses not to have milk from a cow. I, I can't because I'm lactose intolerant. So I've been getting them local grass pastured uh, whole milk because that's the only way that the local you know, that farmers can do it. They can't separate. So is there, is, is there less danger with uh, grass pastured milk and, you know, healthy animals or um, that's question one. <laughs> okay. Let me do it one at a time. It makes it easier with the questions. Um, okay. Instead of good, better, best, we'll put uh, worst and not quite as horribly damaging. Uh, so the grass-fed milk is going to be slightly less damaging than regular milk. But there are so many reasons not to eat dairy products uh, that it really... Now, what we do with people who are drinking milk is we typically say, try some different plant milks because they vary dramatically. Some are better than others. Some are really pretty awful. Uh, try some almond milks. Try some rice milks, try all of the different milks, some soy milks. Uh, some people are very resistant to not eating any dairy milk. Uh, I have them try the Silk brand chocolate milk, which is made from soy, and um, they love it. And they put on their cereal, they drink it, they never go back. And it is not perhaps the best thing in the world, but it has a lot of great nutrients and it doesn't have those terrible problems with dairy products, such as increasing the risk of Parkinson's disease and neuroinflammation dramatically. Uh, there are so many things wrong with milk that I can't tell you that. And grass-fed is uh, possibly actually grass-fed uh, if it's milk. If it's meat and they say grass-fed, it means nothing. Uh, if they say grass-fed and grain-finished, then it means nothing. If they say grass-fed and grass-finished, then it may be slightly lower in saturated fat, but it's also lower in calories, so that in order to get full, you wind up eating the same amount of saturated fat. So I'm going to say that if there's any way you can help your family to try, just bring home different milks every week or every couple times a week, different ones and try them and say, could you try this? Tell me if you like this. And if you hit one that they like and they can switch off, that would be fantastic. And if your family's concerned about calcium, then get a fortified milk. A lot of them are fortified with just as much calcium as cow's milk. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, did you have another question? And, yes. and Gretchen, but, but before you jump in, and if I may say so, 
Uh, you might want to look on our YouTube channel where we have all of our past conferences uh, or many of them. And, and I remember, Steve, you being on stage probably at our last in-person conference. It was. And you ripped through in like two or three minutes or less exactly why nobody should be eating dairy. And it was one of the most powerful things I've ever heard. So Gretchen, if you want to go take a look for that, you can just look up Steve Blake on the Real Truth About Health YouTube channel and you will find access to that. It's very informative. Thank, Thank you, you Ben. Much. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, Gretchen, your next question. My next question is about um, uh, the sprouted. Now they're big, you, big, it's beginning to be accessible to get sprouted oats and sprouted things. I was giving myself and my grandson uh, uh the whole oat groats, you know, cereal that I was, you know, making, and then come to find out that there is a phytic acid issue with that, and then that many vegetables have uh, oxalates in it. So, so there's not much talk about those issues when you listen to these plant-based. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's let's talk about phytates and oxalates. Uh, yes, grains have phytates in their shell. But guess what happens when they're cooked? It breaks down the phytates. And the phytates may actually, and the oxalates too, may actually bind a little bit of calcium, but they have a lot of calcium. So you wind up getting a little less calcium than you would if it didn't have oxalates in them. And we're talking about very small amounts of things that only interfere with absorption of nutrients. And the nutrients are very high to begin with. So I don't consider phytates or oxalates a big problem as long as the grains are either sprouted or cooked. Uh, you do need to do one or the other. You really hard to eat them raw unless you're getting them fresh off the stalk in a growing field. And then you actually can chew them and the phytate and oxalate content is low because they're fresh. And seeds like uh, flax seeds and chia seeds and hemp seeds, should we be, uh, soaking them or and toasting them before we grind them or you know to get the benefits or oh it's not necessary to soak them if you're going to grind them uh we use a coffee grinder and it just takes a couple seconds to grind them up a uh, very easy uh i think that would probably be the best way soaking flax seeds is going to be uh kind of an icky sticky gooey mess and um they'll wind up like chia seeds and not be much fun at all <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you thanks Gretchen and um let's now go to Stephanie hi Stephanie welcome hi hi Dr. Blake thank you for taking the time to answer our questions so um I don't I'm not diabetic or pre-diabetic but I am insulin resistant I have a condition called PCOS that causes insulin resistance and I have no, and I love the part of your presentation where you talked about fruits and stuff and how you can still eat low glycemic fruits like berries and stuff and um, watermelon. I love berries and watermelon, but I've noticed that when I eat um, berries, watermelon, green apples, like the things that are okay for people with insulin resistance, I get physical reactions. Like sometimes I'll get tinglys in my hands and toes, or I'll get like, um, I, I'll get certain physical reactions. Um, like maybe my fingers will, will look a little puffy. And so I'm wondering if you've ever heard of or seen that with someone with insulin resistance and fruit and what can be done and if I can eventually like get rid of that with a plant-based diet and maybe get to a point where I can tolerate um, fruit sugars better. Well, I wonder if it really is the fruit sugars. Is this happening with every single fruit or just a few? Um. I'm all fruit, like any kind of sugar product, like any kind of sugar. So every single and, and fruit carb. gives you this reaction? Um, yes, that I've noticed. That it gives me some kind of reaction, some less severe. Um, like I had a green apple not too long ago, and I, I it, it wasn't so bad. Hmm. Well, if you're experiencing tingling in your fingers, I would recommend that you look into that and... Uh, uh, typically, you get a referral to a neurologist who would look at why your fingers might be tingling. Um, that could be something in your nervous system that you, you'd want to get figured out. Um, I'd want to just be careful and find out if there's some reason for that. Uh, I have, uh, 
it may be something else in the fruit and not the sugar itself because the sugar is so low and slowly absorbed in a, in a green apple. There's not much sugar at all. You know, they're sour. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, is that everything you had or? Um, one, yeah. one, one more curiosity. Um, have you ever heard of uh, inositol or ovacetol? They're, um, they, they, they're supplements that um, help with insulin resistance. And if you've heard of them, what do you think of them? Well, I did mention uh, trivalent chromium, which is in a good multiple vitamin anyway. And that does help with insulin resistance. You might also want to check your diet for saturated fatty acids and see if they're causing insulin resistance, because those are the biggest cause of insulin resistance that uh, I have found in all my research. So I would check there first. If you can get your saturated fatty acids below, say, 12 grams per day or below 6% of your calories, then it may be that your insulin resistance could go away if it's not somehow caused by something else. But it would be worth trying because you may be able to, within a couple of weeks on that low saturated fat diet, uh, check and see, you know, it costs you nothing to check and see if your insulin resistance does go away and wouldn't that be nice? Okay, thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And um, looks like we now have Ainsley and welcome Ainsley. Ainsley, are you there? Ainsley, I, I see I've unmuted you, but somehow we're not hearing you. I don't know if you can turn your volume up. Um, let's try that again. Ainsley? Ainsley, I'm going to come back to you, but if you can work on the volume level on your end, I think it might need to be adjusted. Uh, and now we have uh, coming in George. Hi, George. Thank you so much for uh, doing your wisdom, Dr. Blake. Can you kindly tell us... Uh, what do you know about the <clears throat> prevalence of arsenic and brown rice? I grew up eating brown rice, and I love eating brown rice, but recently a number of uh, <clears throat> nutritional experts and doctors have recommended to limit intake of brown rice due to the prevalence of arsenic. And it, my second question relates to, I've traveled to China a couple of times, and there are the people who eat a traditionally plant-based diet, <clears throat> eat tons of white rice, and they don't get diabetes. And I'm just wondering about <clears throat> the cultural differences and <clears throat> whether white rice is safe for people that <clears throat> have that preference due to their cultural. <clears throat> okay. No, it's a, good, it's a good question. It's good for us to be aware. Uh, rice does bioaccumulate arsenic. All types of rice in all countries bioaccumulate arsenic. And if you were to have one serving of white or brown rice per week, it, the amount of arsenic seems to be fine and not a problem. But if you were to eat it every day and especially several times a day, I know when we visited China, every meal had a bowl of white rice and you would put whatever else you were eating on top of it. And uh, so what I did is I put whatever else I was eating on top of it, but I didn't eat the white rice. Uh, white rice is really a pretty worthless food. Did you know how they discovered the first vitamin, vitamin B1? They discovered it when they first made white rice out of brown rice, because before that, no one had ever had a deficiency of B1. Uh, and that it's a terrible, painful disease that happened. So I would recommend whole grain rices, no more than once per week, and that could be wild rice or brown rice, or there's many, many types of rice out there that are excellent. But white rice, even though it is eaten in some cultures like in Japan and China, one of the reasons they get less diabetes there is they're much thinner people and their livers tend not to get overburdened with fats. And the other reason is the rest of their diet is so good that it manages to overcome the white rice. But the white rice is a detriment, not a help. And so it's best not to eat it. I know it tastes good, but um, if you're having trouble breaking away from it, you could try half rice, half brown rice, half white rice. And then after you get used to that, perhaps you can move to brown rice itself or one of the flavorful colored rice, like Weihani rice, 
which is beautiful and uh, colorful and fun, tasty. Okay, thank you for your question. Thanks very much, Steve. And looks like we are going to give Ainsley another try. Hi, Ainsley. Hi, morning, everyone. You hearing me now? We can, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Doctor, I heard you mention something about sprouts. I, I'm in love with broccoli sprouts and have it in its natural state when it's um, germinated. Is there anything that we can do to, well, they, they, they say that we're supposed to freeze it then eat it in that kind of mushy state. Or in your belief, should we just eat the broccoli sprouts in its natural state? Thanks. I didn't completely understand. There was some breaking up. Ben, can you relay that? Actually, Ainsley, I'm going to have you ask that again. I was a little unclear as well. Okay, doctor. Sorry again. I heard you mention something about sprouts. I like broccoli sprouts a lot because of its sulfurifying content. In your knowledge, is there any way or anything more we can do to the broccoli sprouts to increase its sulfurifying content? Oh, oh, I see. Well, no, there's nothing. Uh, chew them. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's all they need. Um, the, the broccoli sprouts contain glucosinolates and an enzyme called myrosinase. And when you chew them, the enzyme is released, the myrosinase, and it processes the glucosinolates into the uh, sulforaphane, isothiocyanates, including sulforaphane. So really, the broccoli sprouts are good to go. However, if you're eating broccoli, for instance, it's a good idea to chop it, leave it on the chopping board for a few minutes so that uh, it's only when it's broken that the enzyme becomes active to create more sulforaphane. So it's a good idea to leave it out. Or if you blend it, that creates tons of sulforaphane if you're talking about broccoli or kale or any of those cruciferous vegetables. So um, yeah, your broccoli sprouts are gonna be really helpful with uh, the sulforaphane is a wonderful anti-inflammatory, very healthful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. And um, let's now go to, whoops. We're going to bring Ruth back in and welcome back, Ruth. Thank you. Okay. I, when I was asking you about the sugars, I forgot uh, these sugar substitutes, I uh, sweeteners at least, I forgot to ask you about xylitol which uh, seems to be in everything, uh, toothpaste and et cetera. They say it's good. Um, I have something called Xylo Sweet, which is a natural xylitol sweetener. Um, what do you think? And then, uh, okay, so that's one thing. And the other thing, uh, two things, I don't know if you can answer this. I, I, I didn't get a chance to ask it the other night about B12. Um, if I'm just wondering with folate, am I able to take, should I have that with, in the liquid form uh, or in, in the pill form? I'm just wondering, a capsule form. Okay, okay so um, the vitamin B12 can be taken in the pill form. Uh, I've checked and study after study show, you know, they measure people's B12 in their blood, they give them the pills and it raises the blood levels. And they also give them the oral drops, it raises the blood levels. I do prefer the methylcobalamin when I put in my brain and body food, I, I use 200 micrograms per day. And I know that's my only source of vitamin B12. And when I get blood tests, it does show up uh, having good, good absorption. Uh, let's see. Oh, as far as xylitol goes, it's okay. I prefer erythritol. It's a little bit um, mintier and it's a little healthier. But I think xylitol is an okay sweetener too. Um, and of course, stevia is another alternative for non-caloric sweeteners. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, thanks very, very much, Steve. And let me go ahead and... Uh, so uh, it looks like right now we don't have any more questions. We're just about out of time anyway. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm curious. So you've uh, spoken with us today about diabetes in the past. You did a very thorough presentation on Alzheimer's as well and, and dementia. And um, I, I guess I just wanted to follow up. Are, can you just make the correlation for people? Actually, you know, I was going to ask you about the correlation between the diet for diabetes and the, di and the recommended diet for dementia, uh, for dementia and Alzheimer's. And if you find that it's pretty much the same works for both. <laughs> Well, Ben, I think uh, I know your answer. I have to, <laughs> I, I, I have to say that uh, 
Yes, the diets surprisingly are similar. When you look at a good, healthy diet that supplies the nutrient needs of a human being, keeps all the cells vital and active and alive, then this is helpful for both. With uh, dementia and without diabetes, you may be able to include uh, more bananas and mangoes and sweet fruits uh, than you would with diabetes. So there'd be one little difference. Um, I, I, when I think about those 10 steps that we could take, that they did take to reduce uh, diabetes, uh, all of them would be helpful with dementia as well. Uh, but certain nutrients like vitamin B12, I don't see a tie-in with diabetes, but there's a very definite tie-in with dementia. So it would be, you know, I do design the diets a little bit differently, but they're similar because uh, the perfect diet for a human being is a perfect diet for a human being. And it's not that different between the different diseases. We just want to be healthy. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in fact, thank you for uh, another amazing presentation uh, with so much value for all of us and for coming back again and again, and also for being so gracious with your time during this Q and a session. I know I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. So we're going to unmute our entire audience. And uh, what does everybody want to say to Steve Blake? 